Hello everyone. During this test drive at the end of my previous video, I mentioned my next project was going to be aligning the front end on this 2009 Subaru Outback. Doing 50 miles an hour here. As I crest the hill, I'm going to go to neutral and let the engine idle. I replaced the front wheel bearings, the brake backer plates, the steering knuckles, and the front struts. Remember how loud it was here before? Before I can fully enjoy the results of my work, it's definitely time to check the front end alignment. All that noise from one bad wheel bearing. The other one might have been a little iffy, but it was definitely that one on the driver's side as I suspected. Okay, let's do this. Let's start by briefly discussing front end alignment terminology for anyone who may not be familiar with what we're doing. I reference these two textbooks to get accurate information for the following talk. Before doing any alignment work, it's important to do preliminary alignment checks. Preliminary alignment checks, an inspection of the suspension and steering components to determine whether certain specifications, defects, or looseness require correction before performing a wheel alignment. These items include shocks, wheel bearings, ball joints, steering joints, curb height, tire pressure balance and run out, and tire wear patterns. Front end geometry. Terms referring to the angular relationships involving the front suspension, steering system, and tires. In general, the three basic front end geometry parameters the DIYer needs to understand are caster, camber, and toe. And as DIYers, we don't really deal with caster, so we'll primarily concern ourselves with camber and toe. Caster angle is a tricky subject, and we don't need to jump into that rabbit hole. But I'll read some definitions and describe its functions, then I'll leave it alone. One definition of caster angle is positive caster angle, the amount measured in degrees from the vertical that the upper ball joint is located behind the lower ball joint. But most modern cars don't have upper ball joints, so another definition is caster angle may be defined as the number of degrees that the spindle pivot center line tilts from the vertical toward the front or rear of the vehicle. Caster angle is the tilt of the spindle pivot towards the front or rear of the vehicle. Because of caster, the wheels contact the road behind the weight line or center line of the spindle pivot. This produces a trailing effect similar to a furniture caster. In a furniture caster, the weight line always follows its pivot. Positive caster assists in maintaining directional stability and in straightening the front wheels after a turn. In effect, the wheel is being pulled, therefore it must follow. The way the steering wheel turns itself back toward center after a turn is due to caster in the steering geometry. Positive caster has a lifting and lowering effect on the front end as you turn the steering wheel more sharply. For example, when turning to the right, the steering knuckle will rise slightly and the left knuckle will lower slightly. This creates a mild tipping effect when cornering. The tipping effect is the opposite of what's desirable for safe cornering. Because of these undesirable features, most modern vehicles have little or no positive caster. Negative caster angle. 
The amount measured in degrees from the vertical that the upper ball joint is located ahead of the lower ball joint. Many modern cars use negative caster and utilize steering knuckle inclination to assist in maintaining steering ease while driving straight ahead. For example, I've seen 1960s cars with big block engines that specify negative caster. This is used because the weight of the big block actually makes the car too directionally stable in that it's more difficult to turn the steering wheel with all that weight up front. Caster is adjustable in many older cars, but it's not really, or at least not conveniently, adjustable in many modern cars. The Subaru Outback doesn't appear to provide a convenient method of adjusting caster angle. Caster is built into the structural geometry of the McPherson strut mounting system. The car has an amount of strut tilt designed into it. There are bubble level caster measurement tools a DIYer can use, but they're kind of expensive and it's critical to have a perfectly level floor for those to be accurate. And what are the odds you have a perfectly level floor? So thankfully, caster angle is beyond the scope of this DIY video, and this is the last time I'll mention it. Let's move on to camber. Positive camber angle the amount, measured in degrees, that the tire top is tilted outward from the vehicle. Camber tends to bring the point of contact between the tire and the road more directly under the load line. Positive camber gives the wheels a slight outward tilt to start with. When the vehicle is loaded, the wheels are brought closer to the vertical. Positive camber also reduces the tendency of the wheels to spread apart at the front as the car rolls forward. It reduces road shock transferred to the steering system, puts more vehicle weight on the inner front wheel bearing, and reduces steering effort. Most modern vehicles use a small amount of positive camber, usually less than one degree, as you can see here. Excessive camber results in rapid wear on the edge of the tire tread, and camber is adjustable by the DIYer. Negative camber angle, the amount measured in degrees from the vertical that the tire top is tilted inward. Toe in, the amount measured in inches or millimeters that the front of the front tires are closer together than the back of the front tires when the car is not moving. Running toe in should be near zero when at highway speeds. Toe-in compensates for the tendency of the front wheels to angle outward at higher speeds because of friction with the road and other alignment angles. This effect is different for front wheel drive cars. Too much toe-in causes the front tires to wear rapidly on the outer edge. Toe-in is adjustable by the DIYer by changing the length of the tie rods. Toe-out, the amount measured in inches or millimeters, that the front of the front tires are farther apart than the back of the front tires when the car is not moving. Too much toe out wears the inner edge of the tires. Steering wheel centering. The procedure of turning both the tie rod couplings equally in the proper direction to correctly position the steering wheel spokes. This procedure also places the steering gears on their high center position or the steering rack and pinion in its center position. Okay, I'm getting ready to check the camber setting on this wheel. Camber is an alignment specification, which basically means the tire is either tilted out at the top or tilted in at the top, or straight up and down if that's the spec. In order to prepare the car for this check, I, it needs to be sitting on the flattest available surface, that is the most level surface you can find. Which for me, I have this uh, garage floor that's pretty smooth, fairly smooth concrete. I think it's fairly level. This is what I have to work with. It's the best I can do. Hold on, hold on. I can do better. I'll show you how in a few minutes. The other thing you need is to have your tires set to the factory spec on the, 
on the front wheels on the Outback, that's 32 PSI. So they're both set to 32 PSI on the front and the rears are set to 30. That's according to the, the pressures that are on the label on the door post. And then the other thing you need to do is to back the car out and then drive it in as straight as you can. It, it's got the wheels have to roll. You want them to roll like 16 feet at least and then stop. And that's what I did. So now I know if, like, if you let the car down on from being jacked, things were hanging, so they're not going to be spread out to where they naturally would when you're driving. So this allows it to settle into the driving straight position. Just drive it straight in. And so now this is in the best position that I have available to check my camber with. In order to check this, I cut an 18 and a half inch length of steel tubing, one inch steel tubing. I sanded the surfaces smooth. And I'm using just this little angle finder, it's magnetic. I've upgraded this setup to a digital angle gauge I got for Father's Day. So it sticks on there just fine. And I also have a Starrett protractor head here. And that's held just under these bungees, held flat to my bar. So this is really the best setup I can do at home without specialized equipment. Again, I'm about to do better. And my first take on this is that this protractor head is set so that the, the spirit level should be level this way here. And the bubble is all the way just touching the right line. And it's away from the left line as I face it. And the magnetic base angle finder is pointing at about It indicates about 91 degrees, but tipped in. So this mag base angle finder and the steric protractor are telling me that the top of the tire is tilted in a little bit and it's about maybe half a degree. So what are my specs on this? The Outback needs a camber of zero degrees, 40 minutes, that's positive, so tipped out this way a little more than half a degree, 30 minutes is half a degree. And that's plus or minus 30 minutes, so plus or minus half a degree. So this needs to be tipped out at the top more than half a degree plus possibly another half a degree so the range is plus 10 minutes to 1 degree 10 minutes positive camber and right now I have maybe 30 minutes negative camber so the top side of the tire needs to be tipped out this way past the 90 degree mark, over maybe half a degree, uh, and that'll get me close to where I need to be. And now I'll move this over to the other side and see what that looks like. So it looks like the driver's side has a little bit of positive camber on it. Based on the position of that bubble and the level, Combined with this, which says, actually, it says it's more than one degree, doesn't it? It looks like half to one degree positive camber, which is acceptable. Okay, I've stacked up some washers on three of these lugs and tightened the lug nuts down by hand just to make sure everything's held flat in place. I've got this magnetic angle finder 
stuck right on the rotor here and it's jacked up this isn't going to read the same as it did on the wheel so let me just see where it is I'm using a magnifying glass to get a more accurate read right now this arrow is indicating one degree of positive camber I was below positive camber before I was negative so if I add half a degree to a degree positive if I can that'll be good So this reading right now at one degree needs to go to two degrees. Check that again, just to make sure. Yeah, it's under one degree. So, anything happen? Yes, I want the wrong. I don't know if I'm going to get enough movement out of this. The manual shows scale marks on the camber adjusting bolts. They indicate how far to turn the bolt to obtain 15 seconds of camber angle change. Each scale mark is 15 seconds. They're easy to see here. See if I can pry it out a little bit. It doesn't travel far enough on just the... Oh yeah, that chipped out a lot. Still don't know if that's enough. Let's see if this will... There we go. That is almost two degrees. From one degree to, from almost one degree to almost two degrees. So I'll put the wheel back on and move the car and check it again.
don't want that to rotate. After all these adjustments are done, I have to torque these to 112 foot-pounds. Okay, I'm going to put the wheel back on. So we can see here, we move that bubble a lot, and that is about one and a half degrees positive camber, according to this indicator. Just let me see. Well, I would say this cheapy indicator says about there. That's more than one degree according to this, depending on the angle you look at it though. The tip on that thing is kind of messed up so you can't really tell. I say that's half to one degree, so that's right where I want it. It's possible it went a little bit too far. I think I'm going to leave it like that for now. But I'm not completely satisfied. So I did the following. Now let's see what reading we get with the Klein Digital Angle Gauge. By the way, there's a link in the description. So on the passenger side now, we're reading 90.4 degrees positive camber. And with a lighting change, notice the angle of inclination indicator. It's telling us the direction the wheel is tipped, 0.4 degrees. So how did I do with the cheap angle gauge? Remember I said it's about half a degree. Now we're on the driver's side. 90.2 degrees positive camber. I didn't adjust this side because I concluded it's acceptable as is. By dividing 60 minutes by 10, we find out that each tenth of a degree is equal to 6 minutes. So it turns out that 0.2 degrees is 12 minutes. It's actually at the bottom of the acceptable range, with 10 minutes being the minimum specification. Theoretically, this should be okay, but how good is it really? We're about to find out. This isn't as good as it might seem. Okay, so I'm trying to determine just how unlevel this floor is. I set a couple 1-2-3 blocks out at the center line of the axles where my front tires will be when I'm parked here, rechecking the camber. Alright, here's the setup I use to check the floor for level. I have a 1-2-3 block in the footprint of where the driver's side tire will be when I'm checking the camber. And I have another 1-2-3 block in the footprint of where the driver's side tire will be on the floor. 
while I'm checking the camera. Most anyone who's familiar with machine shot practices is familiar with 1-2-3 blocks. They're precision ground blocks of case hardened steel that are exactly 1 inch by 2 inches by 3 inches. I put chalk marks on the floor to park my front tires on. I spanned the two 1 2 3 blocks with a bridge. That way, if there's a hump in the floor or a divot, my level checking of the two tires won't be affected. Right now, that board has a slight upward incline, and the Klein Digital ang Angle Gauge is showing 0.5 degrees on an upward incline going toward the passenger side. Right this second it's reading 0.4. Depends where you set it down exactly. I bridge the gap between the blocks with a pretty straight piece of oak. It's plenty flat and uniform for this purpose. Now how do I know that's accurate? How do I know this board is accurate? Well, I marked the front of the board with one piece of blue tape and the other side with two pieces of blue tape. And I spin it around and set it up on the one, two, three blocks again and check again. And I'll show you the results of that. I know that the board is pretty consistent all along the length. I checked it with a dial caliper and from one end to the other it's within about six thousandths of an inch. So I know there's a taper on it a little bit. When I turn this around to face the other direction it reads 0.5 degrees of declination going that way. And when it's facing this direction toward the camera, it says 0.5 degrees of inclination going that way. So they agree. When I take this board and turn it around so that I have the single tape on the back and the double tapes on the front, then this gauge reads 0.7 degrees. So there's a difference. I turn it around, it's the same thing, 0.7 declination that way, 0.7 inclination that way. So to make this reading as accurate as I can get it with this setup, I have to account for a taper in this board that makes it read differently depending on the orientation. It's either 0.5 or 0.7 depending on which way this board is facing. So. The average of those two is 0.6. So I need to use 0.6 as the actual angle of inclination going from the driver's side higher up, like half a degree, to the passenger side. And now I'll pull the car in and take my camber measurements. Let's analyze what we've learned about the floor level situation. The white line in this slide represents a level floor. The thick black line above it represents the unlevel floor as determined by my measurements. By applying a little trigonometry to our 0.6 degree angle of inclination and 5 foot span between tire footprints, we learn there's actually 628 thousandths rise in the floor from the driver's side to the passenger's side. 625 thousandths is 5 eighths of an inch. Across 5 feet, that's 1 eighth inch of rise per foot. There are a lot of alignment videos online, but I haven't seen any of them address the importance of doing this on a level floor. I might be the only one who shows you how to compensate for an unlevel floor for maximum DIY alignment accuracy. 
This slide shows the driver and passenger side cambers as measured, then shows how to compensate for floor unlevel. For example, the measured driver side camber of 90.2 degrees positive camber minus the 0.6 degrees of floor inclination results in a more accurate camber estimate of negative 0.4 degrees camber. And the measured 90.4 degrees of positive passenger side camber plus the 0.6 degrees of floor inclination results in a more accurate camber estimate of positive 1 degree of camber. Let's convert degrees to minutes. 1 degree is equal to 60 minutes. When we divide 60 minutes by 10, we learn that each tenth of a degree is equal to 6 minutes. Since we have negative 0.4 degrees of camber on the driver's side, and that's 4 tenths, we can multiply 4 times 6 minutes to convert to negative 24 minutes. In the right angle diagram at the bottom of the slide, we see the specified camber of 40 minutes represented in white. Our measured camber of negative 24 minutes is represented in red, and there's a difference of 64 minutes, more than a full degree. Take that 64 minutes and subtract 60 minutes to obtain the portion of the angle that's greater than 1 degree. So 64 minutes is equal to 1 degree 4 minutes. Makes sense, right? 4 minutes is 2 thirds of 6 minutes. 6 minutes is 1 tenth degree, so 2 thirds of 1 tenth degree is 0 0.06667 degree. So 1 degree 4 minutes rounds off to 1.1 degree. I can't be concerned about adding a third of a degree when my measurements on the Klein gauge are in 0.1 degree resolution. Now add that 1.1 degree to the calculated camber measurement to get our target adjustment value. And convert that to our expected camber after the adjustment. Convert positive 0.7 degree camber to 42 minutes. Positive 42 minutes is only 2 minutes greater than the 40 minute target specification. So I'd say we're good with our plus 1.1 degree. Let's get through the passenger side calculations very quickly. 90.4 degrees plus 0.6 degrees equals 1 degree positive camber. We see that our measured 60 minutes is 20 minutes greater than our target spec of 40 minutes. 20 minutes is one third of 1 degree, so subtract 0.333 degree from 1 degree to get 0.7 degrees camber. 7 tenths of a degree is 42 minutes. That's very close to the 40 minute specification, so I'm happy with that. I need to make a positive 1.1 degree move on the driver's side camber. This should result in 91.3 degrees positive camber. And I need to make a negative 0.333 degree adjustment on the passenger side, which will result in 90.1 degrees positive camber. Then when I subtract 0.6 degrees from 91.3 degrees, that leaves me with 90.7 degrees, which is positive 42 minutes. Nearly perfect. Then when I add 0.6 degrees to 90.1 degrees, that gives me 90.7 degrees which is positive 42 minutes. Nearly perfect. Okay, I've got washers on three of the lugs here with the lug nuts tightened down pretty firmly by hand. I don't want the rotor being able to, to move at all. Right now the digital angle gauge is reading Make sure it's perpendicular to the floor. It's reading 91.4.
and I calculated I need it to, to move it in at the top, so I need to move it minus 3 tenths. So I should end up with 91.1 on here. I did torque the heck out of these 112 foot pounds. to move in to 91.1. I went to 91 by accident. There's 91.1. Still at Well, somewhere along the line that changed to 91.2. So it might be at around 48 minutes right now, which is perfectly acceptable. Creating 90 degrees, point zero. Negative camber. Okay, it's on 90. I need it to move out 1.1 degree, so I'm going to 91.1. Still holding 91.1.
Okay, so I torqued the lug nuts, backed the car out, pulled it back in and lined it up with the marks on the floor. I set my camber bar up there on the wheel again with the digital angle gauge. And it's reading 90 degrees exactly, straight up and down. So when you take that 90 degrees and you add the 0.6 degrees of inclination, that means I have 6 tenths of a degree times 6 minutes per tenth. I have a 36 minute positive camber. And remember the target is 40 minutes positive camber. So I'm almost there. And that's plus or minus 30 minutes, so I'm well within spec and at a really good setting here. Okay, now I'm set up on the driver's side and I'm reading 91.3 degrees positive camber. So now let's think about what happens when you take that 91.3 degrees and subtract the 0.6 degrees of inclination. You come up with 90.7 degrees, which means 0.7 degrees positive camber. 7 tenths of a degree, 7 times 6, is 42 minutes. The spec is 40 minutes plus or minus 30 minutes. 42 minutes is about as close as it can possibly get. Now this is a more crude setup than you're going to have in a professional shop. But I think this is probably more than adequate. The uh, camber on this car is set up really good. Okay, so it's time to set the toe in on this. And what I do at home, I know a lot of guys just use a tape measure and measure from tread to tread. I like to start out with the best 2x4 I can find, flat and straight, and run it under there. And then I clamp another piece of wood to the side here, because that's going to be used to contact the rim. Basically, I'm, I'm making a big caliper that's going to measure it. I've got this other 2x4 clamp to the side. It's very firm. It's not going to move or change dimensions. And then what I want to do is measure to the center line of the hub there. And that's about 12 and a half inches up, close enough. So I'll measure 12 and a half inches up here. Put a mark and I'm going to put a screw in there and the head of that screw is going to contact the edge of the rim. So let me get that screw in there. Make sure the screw head extends far enough to prevent the 2x4 upright from contacting the tire sidewall on both sides of the car. You can see here that the head of the screw contacts the rim and nothing else hits it. As I slide this in, it's up against the rim. But not hitting the tire anywhere. So on the other side now, I have my 12 inch speed square and I clamped a piece of, actually a piece of a shim to it and it's set at the height. Remember the center of the hub is around 12 and a half inches. I set this shim 
so that this corner is 12 and a half inches above the floor when it's on top of the one and a half inch two by four. Now you slide this in until it hits the rim. So now I'll just slide this in very gently until it hits the edge of the rim. Just like that. Now I'm going to go check the other side and make sure that that screw head is touching the rim on the edge of the rim here. And if this is touching the rim on the edge of the rim here, I'll make a mark. Now you can use a very sharp pencil to make this mark. Or use your utility knife blade. Right there. You can see it right here. That's my mark. And now I'm going to move this to the front of the wheel to, and measure the difference. Here's where it's most important that this was very firmly clamped tight because you don't want this to move. If it moves at all, that'll ruin the measurement. You throw it off. You need to go to the other side now with the clamp because this screw won't hit the rim if you stay on that end. Because the 2 by 4 is too wide to get it that far under the tire. I'll line this screw up and slide it in just so it hits the edge of that rim. Okay, I'm going to use a very sharp wooden pencil to color in those marks so the camera can see them more clearly. Two knife marks. So now I can get in there with a machinist pocket and measure the difference in toe. And this is almost an eighth of an inch of toe out. The front was wider than the back. Nearly an eighth of an inch. Let's see. That's three thirty seconds of an inch toe out. So the specifications here are funny. If you're just inspecting toe in, they want it at plus or minus one hundred twenty thousandths of an inch, and three thirty seconds. is about 94 thousandths, so it's in spec there. But then if you're adjusting toe in, adjust to the following value, toe in plus or minus 80 thousandths. So I'm 13 thousandths out of spec, if you can believe that. That's crazy. Well, let's see what we can do about that. Okay, the actual target for the toe-in alignment is zero. It's zero plus or minus 80 thousandths of an inch. So I should be targeting zero or close to zero. Now, I read 93.75, let me see, I have it in here, recall memory, I read 0 .09375, which is, rounds up to 94 thousandths, and I thought, well, I can just bring it to 80, but that doesn't make sense, I should be shooting for zero, or 
just a little under. It's good to have just a little bit of toe out in case linkages get loose and stuff as the end as the wheels are driving they'll tend to pull in so you'll end up having toe in if things get loose enough so zero plus something is what I want 80 thousandths might be a little too much so now how do I get 94 thousandths out of there well I discovered that the threads on the tie rods are 16 threads per inch so if you divide one inch by 16, you get 0.0625 or 63 thousandths. What this is, is a 16th of an inch, obviously. It's 16 threads per inch. So how far do I have to turn that? So how many turns on the tie rod do I need to eliminate my 94 thousandths? So it's 0.094 divided by 0.0625, and that's 1.5 turns. So I need a turn and a half on the tie rod or both tie rods combined. Did you catch my mistake? I didn't until I adjusted my toe twice as far as it needed to move. You have to consider as the front of the tires move closer together, the back of the tires move farther apart. So that doubles the measurement of your adjustment. And when I drove in, I, found, I noticed that driving straight, the steering wheel was just a little bit to the right. So the first thing I'm gonna do is adjust the driver's side a little bit, one turn, and that will reduce the toe, the toe out a little bit. It will also bring the steering wheel toward the center, or maybe a little past. And then what I'm going to do is bring this side in half a turn to kind of make up for it. That's what I'm going to do. One turn, maybe slightly less than a turn on the driver's side, and half a turn on the passenger side to reduce the toe in down close to zero. Had I done half as much, it would have been perfect. So, let's see how that works out. <laughs> it turned out I had to go back and reduce my adjustments by half. Okay, that's the driver's side tie rod right there. I believe it's a 19 millimeter nut. It is. Okay, I'm going to try to loosen it. I'm holding the camera, so We'll see how well this works. Okay, it's loose. Um, when everything was apart, I took the opportunity to loosen these nuts and put never sees on them. because I knew I was going to have to come in here and do this. So now I want to screw that tie rod in almost a full turn. That's a hex, and I made five adjustments, so that's like almost a full turn. So let me tighten that down again. Okay, without the camera in hand, I'm going to tighten that down pretty hard. After adjusting both tie rods the way I said I was going to, 
and rechecking the toe measurement, I discovered my mistake. I ended up going back in and undoing my tie rod adjustments by half. Then I rechecked my toe measurement. The final toe adjustment I did on this thing came in dead nuts zero. There was no difference between the two lines. They overlapped each other. Somehow and quite by accident I managed to get perfect zero. And my first take on this is that this protractor head is set so that the, the spirit level should be level this way here. And then what I'm going to do is bring this side in half a turn to kind of make up for it. I've had this little bowl running around in here. I just saw it run around over there. Anytime the door is open, it comes in and then leaves. A dark thing. Anyway. And I'm reading 91.3 degrees positive camber. That's exactly what I was trying to achieve. That was my goal. 91.3 degrees. Thank you for watching. Please take a moment to like and subscribe.